Mike, thank you very much. And I, I just have to echo what these guys have said. Um, the guy has been able to develop the, the Vegetable Growers Association where we've been able to go get funding for a lot of projects. The Hort Society, basically with those two organizations fund almost everything you're gonna see here, these organizations have pretty much paid for. And so your dues do matter. And the other thing that I gotta say is that I'm not quite as good as the building, but the position that I'm in right now only came from the growers going into the administration and saying, hey, we need some additional support. And they created a position that they put me in just from the growers going in and working with the administration. So it does really make a difference. And so we very much appreciate your support and we wanna make sure we're, we're meeting your needs. So hopefully what you're gonna see here is some useful stuff. It's a lot to go over. I'm gonna to try to go kind of fast, but I certainly like to take questions as we go. If I'm unclear or if I leave something sort of undone, um, I'm gonna talk about two new invasive pests. Uh, I spoke about them last year for those of you that were here. Uh, you're probably very familiar with these bugs. This is not all brand new stuff here by any stretch of the imagination, but it's what we're learning, where we're going. This is really a continuum. These are kind of game changers, both of these bugs. They have really altered the way we're managing our orchards. I think they have the potential to, or to even possibly alter what we grow in the state of Maryland. So I'm a little nervous about them, but I, I would say certainly there's a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me that are coming up with a lot of great stuff. Um, you know a lot about the life history of this bug. I'm sure by now pretty much everyone has experienced this, right? Everybody's pretty much had an encounter of some sort with brown marmorated stink bug. So if it's in your house, or if it's in your orchard, or if it's on your brambles, or whatever it is, um, this is this is a pest that gets to be pretty darn ubiquitous, particularly where we're at up in uh, September, October. Okay, so what's new with brown marmorated stink bug management, or what are we what are we learning? How are we dealing with this pest? You know, there's I'm on a lot of committees, and I work with a lot of people that are doing a lot of great theoretical stuff. And my job is to sort of take this stuff and sort of define it and sort of redefine it and filter it and try to keep all the best parts in but make it practical. This is an edge pest. This pest will always be worse on the edge of anywhere, whatever you've got. If it's tomatoes or if it's apples or if it's peaches or whatever it is, it's going to come in from the perimeters. Uh, it is overwintering. Yes, it's overwintering in man-made structures. But research is finding more and more and more that it's, it's, it's really out everywhere in these woods, on all these edges and all these different plants. I have found through scouting, through working with my sabbatical with the USDA over in, in uh, Kearneysville for, for six months, for working with this pest for the last couple of years, I like to walk the orchard. I like to identify where those hot spots are. And you sort of do. You start thinking, you, know, you start seeing it, you start feeling it. Where are the hot spots? I know I can go to Larry Land in the first place, I know exactly where to go to find where they're gonna be in May. Now, I'm not always gonna nail it, and they're gonna fool me sometimes, but I can go to three or four places and I'll find them. I'll figure it out. That date in May, I know where to go because you just keep doing it and you see it. So walking, in my opinion, yes, there are all these traps, there's all this wonderful stuff going on, there's all this technology coming, but it's being out there with your eyes Dr. Thompson used to say, get out of the truck, get on your feet, and get into the orchard and look. Stop walking around or driving around and looking from the edge. You gotta get in there. You find the hot spots, you get out, walk around, shake some branches, you'll see them, you'll find them. And that'll give you your first, your first real indication of when they're moving in. Alternate row middles. Um, Larry Hull was, was on this from the very beginning. <coughs> Keeping the material fresh in the orchard. We have, we have, we're spraying a lot more than we used to spray. We don't have that many more chemicals. Um, we, we have to do whatever we can do to keep the materials out there. And if we can go at lower rates, or we can go out there in alternate row middles and keep that material out there, the longer we can keep it out there, the more likely it is to control and to kill these bugs. I'm saying 100 gallons to the acre as a minimum. We have a lot of people when we started this in 2010 at 50 gallons per acre. And those, those people got into trouble fast. 75 really wasn't enough. 100 gallons per acre, you need coverage. You've got to get the pesticides out there. You've got to get it on the trees. Um, that, late, that late May flush, that's where I'm going out and I'm finding these hot spots and I'm looking and looking. I know pretty much in central and western Maryland that about the first end of the first week of May, I really start to look. 
Second week, third week. By the third week into the fourth week, they're going to be somewhere. And it's going to be that initial flush coming out overwintering. You don't want that one to get established in your orchard. You want to make sure you stop that one. If you can stop that one and not let them get established, you've got a leg up on this thing. And you actually can even maybe take a break. Not a break per se that you're not going to do anything, but at least it's not going to be so intense through the whole season. Because they are going to come back in September. And last year really was a, was a lesson to us. May was not that bad. June, not that bad. July, not that bad. August, you know, hey, we got this thing made, right? We're picking apples. We're moving along. We're good. Oh, we don't need to worry about that. Okay, now we're pulling it out of storage and we're learning our lesson. We had a lot more damage in late September than we thought we did. And it was because we let our guard down and we stopped watching because we're pulling apples off or we've pulled all the peaches off. Well, the thing is, we've also taken away a lot of the crop. So now we have this later crop hanging out there and there's less stuff around it. It's more attractive. They're at that stage of their life where they need to get filled up so that they can overwinter. So they go into your pink ladies and they tear them up. So we want to make sure that we keep our eye out, but don't let them get started. If you start having nymphs in your orchard, that's a real problem. That's like unacceptable. You can't have nymphs in your orchard. You just, that's a bad deal. Um, the September rush, you've got, like I said, you've got to keep your eye out and really watching those late varieties because that's where we really got some surprises. Um, this you've seen before, the chemical list. Um, not a whole lot has changed in the chemicals that are, that are useful. Um, <clears throat> we're certainly trying, I'll, I'll throw this in now because it's kind of disappointing and we'll get it over with and hopefully it'll be fine, but how many of you used bifenthrin or brigade last year under the section 18? A few, okay, good. We are really trying to get that again, but we are really running into some roadblocks. And I don't know where we're gonna go. Um, I started to apply for the renewal <clears throat> in November, and I got shut down before Christmas, and they said, come back and we'll talk about it again at the end of January, and I came back and the information's still not been processed, so I'm not really sure where we're gonna be with that. Uh, we have tried to express to the EPA that if we're gonna get you bifenthrin, we need it sooner. Giving you bifenthrin with a, a full label in September is not what you need. You need it in May. And di dinotefuran, scorpion, or venom, I think that's gonna be fine, but that's a late season product. I think we're gonna be fine on that one. They don't have a big issue with that, but by the bifenthrin, we're running into some issues. Um, <clears throat> here are, I think, some chemicals sort of, of choice that have been you know, pretty darn effective. Um, and the Solfan, we're, we're getting ready to lose that pretty much almost entirely. The Brigade, uh, I think that you know, we still have it on pears and small fruit, so there's some opportunities there. Um, Dinotefuran is certainly gonna be for later. Border sprays, I don't know. Border sprays, some people are swearing by them, I'm using them a lot. I'm not sure what the long-term repercussions are gonna be of border sprays. You know, that's where a lot of your pollinators are. That's where a lot of your beneficials are. And if you start hammering away with orthene in your borders, you may end up with some problems down the road that turn out to be worse than the problems we had to start with. Um, so I've kind of got some alternative thoughts about chemicals that I've been working on the last couple of years um, that I'm gonna present. And I got some fruit here. Uh, th these are uh, Crips Pink, Pink Ladies, and um, it's only three quarters of a bushel there. It's field run. We strip the trees. This is not super duper great, but it's a representative sample. And I wanted to bring you something that was really real. They haven't been washed. They've been in storage. The storage was at 40 degrees since they were picked. But when you go for lunch or whatever, take them, look at them, pick through them, see what you think. Um, because that's really sort of where the proof is in the pudding of what I've been working on. But I've been very concerned about IPM in orchards because we go in with a lot more chemicals, a lot more nasty chemicals, and what are we doing to the beneficials, and what are we doing to all the IPM work that's been done over the last 30 years? That's really, you know, been great work. We've reduced our chemical use down significantly. We've got these beneficial organisms going on in there, but now we're just hammering away trying to kill everything, it seems. So I presented some of this information last year, but I've got some better data this year. Uh, but just to refresh, I'm using 12 and a half pound rate of surround. It's a kaolinic clay product. I'm using it with every time I use an insecticide. Um, 
this was information that came from the initial bioassays that the USDA did, and they, they thought they saw some efficacy there when you mixed this with some of the pesticides, some of the insecticides that didn't seem to work very well on their own, but you put them together, something seemed to happen, there was a synergy there. So at about a dollar a pound, uh, it's not a very expensive product to be putting in there, um, but I think there's some real opportunity because Although, yes, you do get a buildup on the trees, although, yes, there are some, you know, issues with, yeah, the trees are white, there's stuff on the fruit, people wonder what you're doing, the sprayer, that sort of thing. None of this has proved to be significant over the last several years of doing this work. Um, there seems to be sort of a behavioral modification that occurs when there's this clay all over the trees and all over the fruit. They don't like it, but when they do get on it, they seem to groom a lot. And when they groom to get it off of themselves, they ingest whatever insecticide may be mixed in there. So they might be getting a little bit more of the insecticide than they would have gotten otherwise. But there also really seems to be sort of a repellent effect. It modifies their behavior. So my thought is maybe there's the potential, if you don't want to use this on all your trees, maybe you could use this in hot spots. Maybe you could use this around your outer rows because this is an edge pest coming in on you. Maybe you could just do the outer three, four rows around the outside. Keep them off of those trees as they move in. Keep them pushed back to the woods. So instead of spraying the border itself with something and killing everything out there, just keep the bugs out of your orchard. So that might be a potential opportunity for this. Um, basically what I did, the last two years, I've done a standard IPM program. We put out the traps. We're looking for, you know, coddling moth and all that stuff. We base our spray program on the old-fashioned sprays. We're just doing it the old way. We're using things that were lower impact on beneficials, targeting the LEP pests, and just going with it with the surround and seeing what would happen. Not throwing any of the insect in the uh, pyrethroids or anything like that in the mix. And so this is what we ended up with for our spray program for 2012. You can see when we used an insecticide there in red, generally we went pretty light. I mean, we did not go with things that were out there wiping out everything. Um, it's a pretty standard spray program. It's what a lot of people would do. But what I think is the most interesting thing that I really want you to look at is, we quit on August the 13th. And we didn't pick our gold rush until the, ten, or till, uh, the 16th of October. And these pink ladies here, they got picked on November the 6th. They were uncovered. They were left alone. They were not sprayed for two months when these bugs were doing their thing. I mean, the stink bugs were rolling, and we know they were rolling. So there was some effect that we saw on this fruit. And one of the things I experienced in 2010 that really got me onto this was I was going to orchards every week, and people were spraying two and three times. I mean, people were going crazy having to spray and spray and spray to keep residue on these trees. I'm trying to extend this interval back out to where I'm at about an 11 day interval here, which is pretty standard. I mean, that's kind of back to the old days again. So I didn't want a situation where people were gonna to have to be in there and spray you know, two times a week or spray every single week. Um, so I'm trying to look at this from a lot of different perspectives of sustainability, you know, of cost, but also can we produce quality fruit? Um, and again, that's why I brought this to see this residual, because I want you guys to look at the residue that's left on this fruit. So here's just a few shots of them at, at, uh, at Keatesville. You know, they were on everything. Boy, they were into beans heavy this year. They moved into those. Alanthus. <clears throat> this is one of their favorite trees. And there's an interesting study that's being done right now is people are graphing where all the Alanthus trees are. They're finding all, they're looking, using maps, using all that stuff, and they're finding where, what is the range of Alanthus? And then they're looking at overlaying the range of brown marmorated stink bug. And there seems to be a really interesting correlation of if you take the range of where Alanthus has, has, has established itself as an invasive from Asia, and you take this bug, an invasive from Asia, and overlay it, they seem to be following each other pretty closely. So in areas where this tree doesn't seem to be quite as prominent, there, there's a little bit less population. And they're, they're working through to see if that really comes true, but it's kind of an interesting situation. There's a nymph in grapes. They certainly will get into grapes as well. 
Um, this is uh, um, beach plums. Beach plums, they love beach plums. That's almost like a trap crop. Of course, raspberries. This is our site where we did our surround work. Um, we got our pumpkins there in the front. Had corn planted on one side to give me edge because they come out of corn. They love to be in corn, and when that corn senesces, they come out of the corn and they move into the orchard. Then the back side, I've got woods, and then I've got orchard on one side, and then on this end here, I've got some more orchard. So I had two sides that were orchard, one side that was corn, and one side that was woods. Again, it's a perimeter pest, and they're moving into this block. And this kind of shows you out, you don't really need to worry about this very much, but this was the layout of how we did the treatments. Um, but to show again, the corn, the woods, and the orchard, uh, and how, you know, sort of how the, the block was oriented. We've actually built, put in, we're actually in the process right now, we just built the trellis. We're putting in another block of trees so that we can do this without any of the skips. And we picked a new location, so we're gonna continue this work. Um, at Kittiesville, again, funded a lot by Hort Society and vegetable growers and that. Uh, we put in a block of peaches and two blocks of apples just to continue this work. Um, and there you can see where the surround was applied. Again, what the surround looks like, you know, it is not terribly offensive to look at. Um, some people get very concerned. The rate that this was, this can be applied at 20 or at 50 pounds per acre. We're putting it on at 12 and a half pounds. At 50 pounds per acre, that makes a tree look pretty white and people get kind of freaked out over it. But actually, this residue on these trees, there's one grower with peaches and there's another with pick your own apples that are, people are going into the trees and people are picking fruit in the trees. And particularly, the, the one with the apples has been doing this for two years now, is using it as a marketing ploy or not a ploy per se, but he's using it as an educational opportunity. This is an organic product, certified organic. We're reducing our pesticide use. It's very safe. It, it brushes off. Here, look, you brush it off, eat it, no problem. And people are really embracing that and using that. He's using it as a marketing opportunity, um, the, how he's controlling stink bugs without using too many pesticides. So it looks like on the fruit. These are gold rush. And this is actually probably shouldn't be on film because I'm using a knife and I think that violates the University of Maryland safety policy for me I think there's a like a tag on my file you know do not allow sharp objects uh, I even have my glasses on my safety glasses so I didn't put my eye out but I have only minor cuts from from this but the way I evaluate the uh, fruit is the way I was trained at the USDA is we go through we pick a side of the fruit we'll take the fruit pick it up Try to find, if you see anything on the outside, take that and just start to cut through the fruit down to the center and count the number of hits on the fruit. Um, we count from one to 10. If it's 10, it's destroyed, it's, that's maxed out. It only goes as high as 10. Um, <clears throat> one or two, generally we have found the, the work we've done working with growers and talking to growers, we can take to up to about two and a half stings on a side of fruit before people get upset about it or it becomes unmarketable. Um, so there is a level of acceptance. I mean, it's not high, but there is a level, you know, every fruit doesn't have to be perfect. But about two and a half is sort of the standard where we cut it off. Um, and here you can see how the data or the damage presents in the fruit. And uh, you know, you get in there and you've done all this work all year long and you start picking everything and cutting through and you get all excited. You know, sometimes you get great results and sometimes you, I'm like, don't tell me where I am. Just let me cut it. I just want to cut it so, and count. Um, but this is what I did this fall. This is what really got us onto all this was this was August of 2010. Disaster struck. I mean, we were just getting, we got, at Keatesville, we got nailed. We just, just a disaster. We lost everything. We had no earthly idea what was happening. Um, this is a shot of our sprayer and our tractor at Keatesville after the season. Uh, this was never washed the whole season. Um, we need a new windshield wiper. That's our biggest issue. Uh, you can see that we are technologically advanced in our equipment. But, uh, <laughs> but here's good news. Here's more good news. Man, you guys, this is just great. I'm so excited. We get a new pathologist, and in the same year, we're getting a new tractor. <laughs> and you know why I'm getting a new tractor? Well, this has had $16,000 of transmission work in the last two years. But beside that, 
we had a twilight meeting. And I, I'm really, this really had a lot to do with it. We had a twilight meeting and people are like, is that what you really use? Is that really what you guys use? And it sort of applied a little pressure, a little there. Instead of buying a big tractor for the agronomy side, we got our first, up our way, our first real orchard tractor. So we're getting a real John Deere orchard narrow tractor. And last year we got a, a sprayer so that we actually don't have to put 300 gallons of everything in at a time to get it to take, um, to get it to prime. So we're moving forward. And so there's some exciting good stuff happening through all the bad. We're actually trying to respond and do some good things. Um, these are just some slides of what it, well, the data we collected. All season long we monitored. Uh, I had a person in there every week uh, doing timed counts on the trees, um, looking at both the treated and untreated trees. And you can see it was sort of that September time frame, really when things started to, to start to, to happen. And those are the adults. Eggs, I can't explain why that happened in a treated thing, but it was, it was a one-time deal and then it went away. Um, nymphs, we did have nymph movement and you don't want that. You really don't want this back here. Um, it's hard to explain exactly why this, this pans out the way it does, but it is what it is. Now, <clears throat> the data. Okay, this is the data for the, the, um, the surround trials. This is the overall data of the whole thing, okay? So with surround, we had 50% damage. In the control without surround, we had 78% damage. The severity was 396 and 460. Okay, this is not that impressive. It looks like something's happening there, but this is not real impressive. You know, this is like, okay, this is all your data mushed together. So, I worked on, with this on, with Greg Krawcheck, and um, I said, Greg, you know, we, we did this, we set this up, this doesn't look very good, and he gave me some advice. And so what we did is basically paired by location. It's a perimeter pest, right? So let's look at edges, treated edges versus untreated edges. Interior parts treated against interior parts that weren't treated. Let's take two reps that were next to each other in the same type of location, an interior and exterior corn, whatever. Let's look at the, and compare them right against each other and see if there's a difference. Well, this is percent marketable fruit. Now this is outside, this is against the corn. 98% marketable fruit versus 60% marketable fruit. Now, I say marketable because we made the cutoff at two spots. If it was two or less, it was marketable. If it was more than two, if it was three or more, it was not marketable. So when we start comparing the corn side, the wood side, the interior against each other, it starts to look a little different. Marketable fruit here, this is the bordering the woods where there's the highest pressure. We had about 55% marketable fruit versus 45% marketable fruit. Against the corn again, another one against the corn, 60 to 40. And so on, and so on. Now, the thing about that is, remember, that fruit was left for 30 days from the last application to harvest. We didn't spray it at all and we didn't use anything that was particularly good for stink bug control. So if you took the surround, put it into your program, sprayed up to the end, and maybe used some brigade or some venom in that program, a little bit here, a little bit there, you might be able to get this program to where you've got a pretty standard deal all the way through the season. With a few things added in there, you've really got something that makes a lot of sense and gives you the quality fruit that you need. So I think there's some real opportunity there. This is the data from 2011. Um, 2011 we had a lot less pressure, so we had a lot better results. Um, generally, I think that things went very well. I mean, it looked very encouraging in 2011. Um, and this is the fruit. This is what it looks like. Again, I brought you some fruit here that's been in storage. Please take a look, see what you think. Cut it, take a bite, do whatever you want to, take it home, see what you think. 
But pink ladies is a variety that's very late and a variety that's going to get hammered. And it's worth a lot of money and it stores well and people like it. So that's why I choose, chose that to, to bring as an example. Okay, how are we doing on time? Got almost 15 minutes. Yes! Okay. Now, how are we doing on, spot on um, brown marmorated stink bug? I think we have some control options. I think things are coming. If there's anyone that's interested in trying some surround, I have limited quantities. So if somebody wanted to try a little bit of it through Mike or my information or what here, send me an email, do whatever. Um, we've had a couple of great cooperators already, and I think we're getting some people that are interested in, in using this and really continuing to use it. Okay, spotted wing drosophila. The first, brown, brown marmorage stink bug is bad. This is worse. I don't want to be one of those crazy people running around saying, you know, this is the end of the world, you know, give up your farm, sell it, develop. But you might want to consider develop. I don't know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is bad. This is an invasive pest that has moved in on us in the last couple of seasons um, that has just been a really interesting deal. I went from, I'm not worried about this, it's not a problem in the beginning of 2011. I'm not worried about it. I was asked to go out to Ohio to give a presentation. I'm like, we don't even have them. Well, they asked me in, I guess it was May, and the presentation was in, it was actually in January of 2012. My whole world changed in that period of time. And uh, I really got my eyes open to this bug. This is a nasty pest. And the biggest problem with it is here is this brown marmorate stink bug, it makes a little brown spot, okay? It's a little brown spot, and it's gone. But when people take home raspberries that have six maggots in them each, and they put it in the refrigerator, and it's there for 15, 20, 30 minutes a day, and the maggots come out, people tend to get somewhat excited. I don't understand it, but... They freak out. And where do they come? They come back to the stand. And they're at the market. My fruit's got worms in it. I want my money back. I'm calling it. I want this. What's going on? Okay. Bad situation. Oops. I lost my mind. Okay. We talk about brown marmorated stink bug all the time. We talk about it. It gets in people's homes. It's a big problem. We tend outside of our industry to not talk about spotted wing drosophila a whole lot. Because one, it's maggot in people's fruit. Here I am on television. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, it's maggots in people's fruit. And what's the alternative to maggots in people's fruit? Well, no fruit, absolutely. Spray the heck out of it. Spray the heck out of it. We were putting on maybe one spray application, one insecticide application on some of these brambles. We put on some, like, 11 to try to get them to come out, to have fruit all season. It's tough. And do you want to tell people that now we've gone, we've whatever leavened umpted our spray program? I mean, it's not, this isn't, so the information on this bug has not gotten out to you all, I think, quite as readily. And, and, it, and it's been a tough situation. It's hard to talk about. I, 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 I've been really just perplexed in trying to work with this. My role in working with this pest has been Dr. Dave Bittinger up at Penn State at, at Biglerville um, gave me the opportunity. He said, here's some traps. Take them down to Maryland and see what you think. Um, actually, Bob Rouse and Jerry Brust down at Butler's Orchard uh, found the first ones that Jerry had positively identified in Maryland. Later in that season, I started scouting orchards up in western Maryland and central Maryland, and <clears throat> all we had to do was put a trap out. It was just a, it was amazing. They just put a trap out, come back in a week, and they're there. I mean, they didn't take any time to be every place. Um, so what they're doing is they're laying their eggs in the maturing fruit, not the overmature, but the maturing fruit. Um, here's just a shot of the, some of the traps we've been using. And uh, we've been running traps all over the place trying to figure out how well the traps work and, uh, and, and how wide this, uh, spread this pest is. And um, pretty much I would say that if you don't think you have it, you probably do. Uh, if you haven't seen it and had had a problem with it, that's great, but be prepared. Uh, just a couple shots of what it looks like in the fruit or on the fruit. Um, it's pretty disgusting, and people just 
just don't take to it very well. Um, blueberries, um, I, I thought maybe at first we'd get away with our blueberries being okay. I think maybe some of the early blueberries got away, but the later blueberries, we started running into problems in blueberries as well. So brambles are bad, but blueberries, and in other parts of the country, blueberries are really in trouble. Uh, down in Florida, uh, and coming up the coast, and then of course, you know, up in New Jersey, uh, this, is, this is a big problem. And those fields aren't set up to be sprayed and managed like maybe we do it down here. Um, so they've got some real challenges with the way the fields are even laid out and how they're gonna manage this pest. Uh, cherries, um, we've certainly seen some issues in cherries. Um, but as I speak about cherries, um, we have to be careful. Um, some of our standard management does help to maintain some, some control of this pest. These cherries, they have a lot of exit holes in them. Obviously, there's a lot going on here. There are a lot of problems. Um, you can see they were picked June the 14th. Uh, they're tart cherries. Um, and it looked like, oh boy, this is a bad spotted wing drosophila problem. Well, there were spotted wing drosophilas in these fruit. But 75% of what was in this fruit wasn't spotted wing drosophila. And that makes this thing that much more interesting and exciting to work on. Um, <clears throat> initial identification is very difficult to really confirm exactly what you've got. So what I did with these fruit is these actual fruit I took back to Biglerville. I gave them to Dave Biddinger up there. Dave put them in a fish tank with sand in the bottom and he reared the maggots out and then actually reared them all the way to adulthood so he could identify everything that was in the fruit. And 75% of it was not spotted wing drosophila. So we've got stuff going on. It may have already been here. It may be new. It may be something else. There's a lot happening in this fruit. But this fruit had not had a lot of insecticide on it at all. It had been uncovered for a little bit too long. And I think that's why we ran into some of the issues that we did. That's what the, the uh, maggots look like. That's my finger. Not the greatest photo, but it does kind of give you the scale a little bit, sort of what you're, what you're going to find. And <clears throat> sometimes there can be 25, 30 of these things in a fruit. Um, so, you know, one or two, people are going to gobble it down and they're not going to notice it. But, you know, if they've been in the cooler or been in the refrigerator and then, you know, 10 of them come out, people start flipping out. A little bit about the life cycle. The thing is that this pest is an interesting deal. We didn't know if it would overwinter or not. It doesn't seem to have a problem overwintering here. Uh, that's not a big issue. It seems to take it a little while to get up and get going in the season. Um, hot weather will shut it down. It does stop when it gets real hot. So if it goes like 95 degrees or higher, it'll stop reproducing for a while, but then it'll start up again. Um, but you can see, I mean, this thing can be pretty prolific. Uh, it, it really, it can make a lot of babies fast and over a long period of time. And so once you get them established in a planting, you're in big trouble. And I really think we are in a unique situation here. I don't want to brag about our growers too much, but I think it's true. Ohio and North Carolina and other states, people are just shut down, entirely shut down. I mean, they're talking about quitting. But in Maryland, and I've got a slide that'll show you a little bit about, I think, how we've done. Growers have adapted and growers have worked with this thing. And although we're having problems, it's not as devastating as it seems to be in other places. Um, you know, when I talk to somebody from Ohio and they say they're quitting, I've not really talked to too many people in Maryland that says I'm, they say I'm done. I've talked to some people that say, I'm gonna put off planting more fall brambles until you guys get a better handle on this, but I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, not, not gonna quit. There's a serrated ovipositor there. It can cut into the fruit and how, that's how it lays its eggs. Um, the male has the spots on the wings, the female doesn't. Um, so we can really only identify, easily identify the males, the females, it's a lot harder to do. And can you imagine having, these things are, are pretty small. And you get a trap that's about that big, and it's got a thousand of these things that's floating around in vinegar. And you've got to pour it through a tea strainer and then look at it under a microscope and identify 2,000 little wings I mean, this thing is an arduous task to deal with, to figure out what's going on. And so that slowed us up a lot for monitoring. Some of the other uh, flies that we also see and have in this area, 
Uh, just other things that get confused with spotted wing drosophila. Um, just another shot on strawberries. I think in a lot of ways your, your early regular normal strawberries are going to get away with this. They seem to be okay, particularly, particularly if you're monitoring and maintaining um, uh, sap beetle control. Um, I don't want to say strawberries are safe, but, but June strawberries seem to be okay at this point. Everbearers, that's not quite the case. Um, here's a shot of how the population seems to evolve from 2011. It seems to get a lot worse as it goes. So earlier on, we seem to be okay, but as it moves through August and then even through November, the numbers continue to go up. So your late raspberries are particularly getting hammered. Your, your back end of your blackberries, your late blueberries, your fall ras raspberries, they're the ones that really seem to be getting nailed as the season goes on. Um, here was my first detection for last year. It was June the 7th. We had found nothing. We had been scouting since early April. We went through strawberries and we were fine. No problem. Uh, we were moving along. Everything was looking good. And blackberries, and man, it happened and it was game on. It never stopped. It never let up. From June the 7th all the way through the whole season, it was just, you know, stand by. Here we go. It, it, it never let up. Now, but here's an interesting slide from Larry Land where although we started seeing detects, they were able to maintain the population. And I would say that it wasn't a horrible, aggressive spray program, but it was they were able to, by knowing that they were dealing with it and knowing they had it, and please interject if you think different, by being aware, you were able to manage it and keep it under control to where you really had pretty acceptable levels of damage. I mean, there's, nobody wants this, but. We sprayed once a week. Once a week. And keep an animal. You know, rotating through chemicals. Right. So they were able to manage. And it's not what we want to be doing, but we can stay ahead of it where if they had stopped or never started, I don't think, I think it would have gotten out of control to where you, you couldn't have done anything with it. But here you can see the numbers will continue to go up even when the crop is gone. I mean, this thing just keeps coming into the winter. And then over winters, the, the, uh, the females are, are bred, the bred females, the made of females, over winter, in the orchard, in the vineyard, around on the outside of the perimeter, and then move back in in the spring. That's how we monitored in strawberries. We monitored both plastic culture strawberries and matted rose strawberries. Blackberries, everything looked good for you know the early part of the season, and then man, later on it just got ugly. It just got real ugly. Uh, but keeping everything clean, I would say one thing that's kind of important to do when you're spraying, you know, Dave was talking about spraying and nozzles and all that, you definitely want to have some nozzles that are pointing down. You want to make sure you're getting down to the ground. If you're picking bad fruit, I know that this is a pain. Don't just drop bad fruit in the, in the, in there, in the, in the uh, aisle. Don't drop it. Get it out. Sanitation, I think, certainly has something to do with it. Um, so keeping things clean, don't spray alternate row middles. Spray every row. Keep your gallons of water up. I think that's important, too. Um, so just some kind of overall things and monitoring and looking at this. The, the, the traps are a tool, but they are not the answer. They will tell you something, but we don't know exactly what they tell you, and they don't tell you a very good story. When I would monitor, it's sort of like with the brown marmorated stink bug. I go to the hot spot, I go, I look, I work those trees. I just started pulling fruit apart. I'd go into areas and I would just start pulling fruit apart. I'd go through and I'd just randomly pull fruit apart, particularly on the perimeters, but I would pull it apart and look for the maggots. And I could detect it that way much faster than I could in a trap. And then inform the grower and let the grower go to work. Um, blackberry or black raspberries seemed to get by. Strawberries seemed to get by. The early blueberries were okay. Um, sweet and tart cherries, I think there's some issues there depending on your existing programs. But your later blueberries, blackberries, fall raspberries, those guys really ran into trouble. They really, those crops really got nailed. Um, again, I think in strawberries, if you're managing for sap beetles, I think you can do okay. Cherries, if you're putting on insecticide applications and watching, I think you can do okay, not letting the fruit hang too terribly long. Uh, the fluorocane raspberries, monitoring them, I think you can get through the season without too much additional input. But again, the final three, that's where you've got to focus your energy. You've got to make sure you don't let things get out of control because if you let it get away from you, you're done. 
Uh, here are some of the products. Um, the folks at uh, Michigan State in Florida, up at Rutgers, they've been doing more and more trials, trying to get things to go through faster, try to figure out what's going on, what we can use. Your products there at the top are good, but they don't last very long. They're not going to hang around. Malathion was sort of the go-to product last year. There were a lot of people that used a lot of malathion, but malathion does not hold up very long. So you put it on, and yeah, it'll do a good job, but it doesn't last. Um, what I've got there is the product that it, or the, 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 um, the fruit it would be labeled on, and then in the parentheses is the number of days to harvest. Um, so you can see in Trust 7 and a sale, they're good, and they can certainly be used for rotations. But I think down here, the good products with the longer residuals, these are the products that really were the money products. These are the ones that really did a good job. And, you know, if you're growing blueberries, I'm not sure when the last time you put lanate on them was, but you may want to think about it because lanate, yes, Molly? I just, where can we get this slide? I'll, I, I'll send it to you. Um, actually, there's a handout outside some handouts that have some of this information. But this I just made, so I can send this to you. Um, Lanate <clears throat> is really good. Um, it seems to be very effective and it lasts a long time. But it's not labeled on very many things. Imidan, uh, that's another one that's sort of on that list of products that are going away. But, um, you know, if you're a ways out on harvest on your cane berries, Imidan's a really strong option to put in there and give you some real long-term control. Um, I think, again, Brigade by Venture, by Fenthrin products, very effective. They work really good. Uh, Mustang Max held up well, did a great job. Danatol also. So these are products that have gone through some uh, work that's been done in three universities. And those folks have done a really nice job. Um, but they're using a lot of water. And that's another, another issue here, I think. You know, maybe 120 is too much, but 100, I think you really want to be, you really want coverage. No alternate row middles on this. It's every row. It's high gallons of water. It's just staying with it. And until we can develop better traps, until we can determine if there's beneficial insects that we can release, until we can figure out different strategies, if you're going to be growing particularly those later fruits, this is what you're going to have to do. And... Um, you know, you're going to be spending a lot more time in this, which, you know, we thought with the surround stuff, we're trying to get you out of the vehicle. With this, we're getting you right back in it again. Um, and just to make things even a little bit better, here's another one that's just moved in and it's just been identified last year in our area. Um, the good news is, well, it's not good news for the grape growers, but I don't really work that much with grapes. This seems to be a bigger pest of grapes than other small fruit. It also seems to be much more interested in overripe fruit. But it's a new invasive, it's another one uh, we're gonna be dealing with. We're gonna be monitoring for this more next year to determine its range and its impact. Um, but it's got these cool fluorescent racing stripes on it. So if you're an entomologist, it's really cool. If you're me, I'm like, no, I don't care. But uh, you'll be hearing about the African fig fly uh, coming to you soon. So, I hope I did okay on time. No, you're um, I'll put this fruit out here, and during lunch or whatever, grab it, look at it. If you've got questions. <coughs> yeah, any quick questions for Brian? Again, he'll be around. And yeah, I'll be Brian. around. Brian, just, oh, yes, one, just one observation. Yes, sir. The wild cherries in the woods are a very good host for that spotted wing drosophila, because I was monitoring one of my vineyards that I consult with. Mm -hmm. We were catching them like nobody's business in the traps, no damage in the fruit. And then when it turned warm, the population crashed. And of course, he used some seven for Japanese beetle that mm -hmm. may help the crash. But they were getting numbers in the traps early July that were unreal, but no damage in the, the fruit. But they tell me that they can get into the fruit later in the season, so mm -hmm. it's something we don't want. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Fruit fly. That's the pointer. Fig fly, that's yes. Backwards. Forwards with well, the we grow figs, so does that attack figs also? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Molly. I was just going to add. I mean, I used uh, my observations. I had your traps out, and I would say don't rely on on the traps because, from a farmer standpoint, lifting out the trap 
putting it through them and trying with your little thing to figure out whether the wings have spots. I mean, if they're in there, um, and it was too late by the time I saw them in there, and they were in our raspberries, and we had the customers coming back. They took them home, and I had never heard this before. So here you say that I'd never heard this before. It's the truth. You take it home, and there's something about chilling those in the refrigerator within a half an hour. That particular day when they showed up, the customers were back. You put them, you put red raspberries in a nice crockery blue bowl in the refrigerator, and it, you have a sea of maggots on the edge of the bowl. They come out just like that, and they, they brought them back. And then they posted about it on our Facebook page. So. <laughs> Yeah, there will be fresh raspberries for lunch today. <laughs>